We're in the book of Revelation in chapter 7 this morning. What we've seen at this point, most immediately in chapter 6, was the breaking of the seals of a scroll that was presented to us in chapter 5. The breaking of these seals represents the beginning of sorrows, represents the beginning of the tribulation, a time in the world in which there will rise an Antichrist, who's called also the Beast, and he will be flanked by a man we refer to as the False Prophet. We will learn about them in chapter 13, but we see them introduced, or at least the Beast or the Antichrist introduced in chapter uh, 6, as the first seal is broken. The second seal brought to us war. The third seal brought to us famine. The fourth seal brought to us death, anarchy, and murder and and mayhem, really. We have beasts rising up against humans. Something happens to make an insanity ensue that really does shake all of nature down to its very core. We find that it will be a time of great martyrdom in the breaking of the fifth seal. And then when we come to the sixth seal, what we find is that there will be a great earthquake. We connected it with the Yellowstone volcano simply because we remember that when we review the scriptures, we wonder with such great influence and power, why is the United States not mentioned? And when we read about this great earthquake, fire falling from heaven, the the, the sky rolling away like a scroll, we can begin to see how something like a super volcano could make a big big impact in putting into framework what would really be a continent killer. And we realized in our review of a video on Sunday night that there are actually four countries that have already got agreements with the United States that if that volcano did in fact blow, they would be willing to take our people. Preparations are already made, not because they know it's going to, but because they don't know when it could. There was one postulation it would be 2070, but it has been revised to be 2020, and they just don't know. And in the Yellowstone Park, everything's been moving since about 2003, about 10 centimeters. The land literally is rising about 10 centimeters. It's pretty crazy. But what we saw was something there that really did reflect upon why maybe we're not even mentioned. Because when that super volcano, the likes of which in recorded history has never been seen before, uh, we saw that that could certainly uh, be a game changer on the uh, canvas of history and time. I would then encourage you to not lose heart, however, Because when you look at the end of chapter 6, you find that the people of the earth in that day will finally give way to a confession that they are loath to make. And it is that the great day of the wrath of the Lamb is come, it says in chapter 6 and verse 17. They don't want to say that. They don't want to give God glory. They want to kind of pretend as if there's nothing here to see. They'll just move on. They want to make it seem as if all is well and they've got this. But when you see the four horsemen, or I should say the four horses, because the people on them are not as important as the, as the horses themselves as we saw last time. The horses represent the motions of God in history. He's the one who allows the Antichrist to come. And so the white rider just simply has God's permission well, let me not dwell there too, too much further, but understand the seals have been broken. There's one seal left because this scroll was sealed with seven seals. The seventh seal will represent for us the coming of the seven trumpet judgments. What we've seen is the seal judgments. They will give way to the trumpet judgments. However, God loves mercy. Isn't that good to know? I'm so glad that's true. And because it is true, we have an interlude, what we may call a parenthetical insert that is brought before us in chapter 7. 
Uh, people will ask many times when they begin to uh, get acquainted with these truths, will anybody be saved? Can people be saved? Now, the, the problem is, is that what they're doing many times in asking that, if they're on the outside looking in, meaning they're not saved, but they're, they have a respect to God's Word, but have not ever really personalized it, and made Christ their own as Savior and trusted Him, is they're actually, in some sense, possibly hedging their bets or, or wondering what's the, what's, what's the lay of the land here? Am I going to be able to get saved after the rapture? Well, the Bible assures us in the book of 2 Thessalonians that God's going to send strong delusion that people might believe a lie. Which means that if you've known things, but you've never personalized it, if you've never said, Lord, I need to be saved, and I need you to save me on the merit of Christ and Christ alone, not my merit, but by the merits of Christ, if you've never come and called upon Him, as the Bible admonishes us, that whoever would call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, if you've never, ever asked the Lord to save you, then you may be one of those people who would like to think that maybe, just maybe, you could get saved afterwards. But, the more you hear the gospel, and the more that it rattles your cage, and the more you dismiss that rattling, the more your conscience begins to die. The Bible says in Romans 1, that because what may be known of God was not retained in the knowledge of the world, that they became darkened in their minds, they changed the image of the incorruptible God into the image of beasts and so forth, and man and beasts and fish. People were worshipping all kinds of things. It gave way to idolatry. They said, you know, this is who God is. They believe God's a Santa Claus in our day, perhaps. Not like we don't see people worshipping fish, is what I'm saying. Well, we, 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 well he's a Santa Claus. He's, he's a, a big man in the sky, you know, the man upstairs. No, he's a holy God to whom we must give an account one day. And the reality for you and me is just to remember that this is serious business. And what we're reading is the field manual for those who will be in the tribulation. We're also told in other places that people carterize their hearts with a hot iron, that they are callous in their consciences. It happens, you know. I'll tell you, you know, if, if you've ever lost a loved one and you've had to go through the the pang and pain of loss, devastating sometimes. The first couple of days is brutal. The first week or two, the first month, maybe a three months, I don't know. But as time goes on, one day you wake up and you just kind of get a shower and you get a cup of coffee and then eventually you get back in life. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit convicts us and we don't move. We get really devastated by the truth that we could end up in an eternity in hell. It blows us away. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But if we put it off and dismiss it, the reality is it gets easier to dismiss. We literally get over it. And that's a scary place to be. So I say that at the outset of this chapter because I don't want to give you any false uh, illusions or false ideas that somehow maybe I will know all this information, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to table it and I'll get saved when the rapture happens. Not a good idea. Because what ends up happening is God is going to literally, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 11 says, For this cause God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So there's going to be a, an amplification of delusion in those days for those who have probably been very foolish in playing Russian roulette, as it were, with the truth of the gospel. Now, with that said, I need to say, to this, again, say this again and reiterate, God loves mercy. In fact, the whole tribulation period is a time of mercy. It's God's altar call, if you will. He's asking people through the calamities of the day and time to come to a saving knowledge of His Son. And those people who do so will have to pay a very high price for having done so. Beheading will be the, the execution method of the day, and we will see that as the book unfolds. But chapter 7 is this parenthetical insert between the breaking of the sixth seal and the breaking of the seventh seal, bringing in uh, the seven trumpet judgments. And as we look at chapter 7, verse 1 says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, 
holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now, verses 1 down to about verse 8 tell us about the sealing seal of the 144,000. God is going to seal some servants, okay? You and I have a seal. It's the sealing of the Holy Spirit. We don't work in seals. Some of you ladies like that stuff, you know, where you can get the nice little artsy things and you do scrapbooking. And sometimes it comes with like seals where you get the wax and you push an imprint on it. That's the kind of thing they would use to officially ratify documents in the days of, 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 of history, really, throughout history. And such is the case here. God himself is in the business of sealing people, and he's done it on a number of occasions. You and I are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is the seal of God in our lives, that it's like a, it's a ratification, it's a, it's a comfort to us, and the reality of that sealing, and it is a, a, a reminder that we are secure. Because what God did was He sealed us by the Holy Spirit. And literally, it's been used not only as being like sealing a document, but the Bible says He's the earnest of our expectation. If you've ever given earnest money uh, in buying a house, you give, say, $5,000 that says, I'm planning on buying this house. But if you back out, you lose the $5,000. And, and, and the Bible says in, in Ephesians that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, who is, our, who is the earnest so he's like the engagement ring. And when you got married in biblical times, if you were, if you were going to be married, you would be engaged with this, with this promise of marriage, like betrothal. He's the engagement ring, the earnest. But if the person backed out, uh, they would have to give up the engagement ring, the dowry, whatever they gave. This is why when Mary and Joseph were betrothed, he would have to put her away, which was a way of saying he would have to have a divorcement from her. Even though they'd never been uh, officially ratifying that, uh, that, that relationship, he would have to break it by divorcement. And what I'm saying to you is the ceiling you and I enjoy is unique. We live in grace ground. <laughs> it is amazing. He keeps us, okay? But the kind of sealing we're going to see here harkens back to the Old Testament. But in verse 1, when it says that these, uh, these angels are standing there and they're holding the four winds uh, from the four corners of the earth, you understand the, that this, this has moorings in the Old Testament like so much of the book of, uh, of Revelation does. You have to kind of have a good working knowledge of the Old Testament to get a hold of this. And where we would see these four winds uh, in another place would be in the book of Daniel in chapter 7 and verse 2. You might put that next to verse 1. Daniel 7 and verse 2 would be the verse to go to. It is there that Daniel has this dream, and in the dream he sees these four winds that they're, they're kind of working around in, in, uh, in an upheaval over the, uh, the sea of the earth, which shows the chaos of the nations. And what he sees is rising up out of the sea by virtue of these winds blowing, you know, is, and the influences that are being brought by these winds is he sees four beasts coming up in Jan Daniel chapter 7. And, two and following. The first beast he sees is a lion with wings who ultimately comes to the place where he stands up like a man. And it was emblematic of Nebuchadnezzar, who was the great lion, the glory of all kingdoms. He was the golden head earlier in the book of Daniel. But here he's the lion, and he's, wing, he's got wings, and he's regal, and he's powerful. But he gets over, uh, he gets uh, over proud, and God smites him with insanity for seven years. And then after he comes back to his senses, he stands up as a man. And I think it's chapter 4 of Daniel where he literally makes a declaration that God is the God of heaven heaven and earth, and nobody's over him, and everybody needs to honor him as such, and literally gives his own testimony about how God brought him to a saving knowledge. Uh, would to God he would put insanity on everyone for a little while and get him saved, but Nebuchadnezzar was this great lion who was had wings and did things very, very powerfully, very decidedly, but got full of himself and God brought him back to a humble position as a man. So in that first movement of those winds, we found the lion. The second movement, he said, I saw come up out of the, out of the, um, out of the uh, sea of the earth. Is what he saw next was he saw a great bear. And this bear was raised up on one side higher than the other. 
And this bear is representative of the Medes and the Persians. These are, these are uh, what we would call worldwide kingdoms that came through. We had earlier than Daniel's time, we had Pharaoh and the Assyrians. And then subsequently, we had Babylon. And then we had the Medes and the Persians. And you'll know this one because we're not really as familiar with those guys. But you'll remember the Greeks, you know, Alexander the Great. Well, he's the third guy who comes along. The Medes and the Persians, one was stronger than the other. That's why this bear was heaped up on one side. Uh, then we see the uh, Greece was represented in a leper who had four wings. There were four generals under Alexander the Great. You may know he died around the age of 30 years a of age from dissipation. He said, the only thing I, de I, I, I regret is that there are no more worlds to conquer. <laughs> he, said, he, just, he just kept going. He kept pushing. And he had this great worldwide kingdom in and, and that he was the Grecian leader. We know Greek was the language of the New Testament. We know that Greece was the uh, kingdom of uh, what we might call all these philosophers, Aristotle and Socrates and great thinkers and philosophy. You may remember that they were the ones who paved the way for, uh, uh, for the roads to be made to be passable from place to place. They Hellenized the entire ancient world. And that means that they gave it one language, they gave it free, free pass through. They just really got everything ready for when Jesus would come. So everybody would have the same language, everybody would be able to uh, interact with one another. But they were a great kingdom. And for, for, um, when it says he had four wings, when he died at an early age, four generals split up the four quarters of this kingdom. And, uh, and, and we find that, he actually, um, that they actually become heads, four heads, because when he died, they become leaders and the ones who govern that. The final movement of these winds were, was upon a beast that came up that had no real connection in our minds. It just says that it was a beast terrible and dreadful. But things that we do see is it says that this beast had iron teeth which reminds us of chapter 2 of Daniel, because in chapter 2 of Daniel, the Bible says that those legs were uh, of iron. And then it says not only did he have uh, iron teeth, but it had ten horns. And we understand that there's supposed to be ten kings come up out of this, uh, out of this beast. And ultimately, it said it had ten, uh, ten horns, because these teeth and then these ten horns give way also to having feet, that stamped the ground. And the last part of this Roman Empire is the legs were there, but they went into the way, you know, we talk about the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. They went the way of every kingdom before them. However, the Bible tells us that Rome is going to be revived. <laughs> and it's going to be led by ten kings. It's going to be iron mixed with clay. So the iron's still there because it's Rome, but the clay and iron don't mix. So they're not going to be completely in harmony. And it even says in Daniel 7, that one horn's going to come up and have eyes like a man, and he's the Antichrist. What I'm saying to you is these winds aren't without significance <laughs> in, chapter, in chapter 7 and verse 1. These four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds represent for us a calm before the storm. Because chapter 6 really represented the cataclysm, cataclysm uh, of all the things that would naturally unfold immediately if the rapture happened. Think about it. Rapture happens, the whole world falls into chaos, and you begin to try to gain some control. And so that's what happens. The world's in upheaval, a white rider comes, but war has to come because not everybody's on board with how we're going to play this now. And subsequently, famine, anarchy, death, it's going to be terrible, things are going to be bad. A great earthquake, God loosens up the mountains and the islands, which will flee away in chapter 16. And subsequently, God's just getting everything ready. But right now, He's set the table. The first three and a half years probably are represented by chapter 6. But now what we have is just before that blowing of the trumpet, the Bible says these, these angels had the four winds and they were told not to blow on the earth. In other words, don't interfere with what's going on now because i got something I need to do. And so God says in verse 2, and the Bible says in verse 2, And I saw another angel ascending from the east. Having, set, having the seal of the living God. As I mentioned, the seal is important in this chapter. And he cried with a loud voice to those four angels to whom it was given to, look at this, hurt the earth and the sea. You know, when they would siege a, uh, say, some sort of a city in the ancient day, sometimes they would be there for over a year, sometimes two and three years. And the way they would set the siege is, they would set the siege such that all of their armies would come and 
set up shop for about two, three years, whatever it took to get them real hungry inside the city. And what God's going to do is He's going to withdraw the food, withdraw the water, withdraw the air, really, the sunlight, and the security and sense of safety. But He says that they're going to hurt the earth. The Bible says it was this, that uh, these angels, it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. And he told them, don't hurt the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until, in verse 3, uh, we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So verses 1 to 8 are talking about that primarily. Now these angels we've talked about, these winds we've talked about, they're not without significance. In fact, very significant. They're the influences from God on the earth. He raises up one and puts down another. I think it's Psalm 75 says this. He is the one who raises up one, puts down another, and brings judgment on the earth. But what we're seeing here now is, is he's got a plan for redemption. And I'm so glad that's true. I'll tell you, I've got loved ones that do not know Christ. Young loved ones. I've got nephews. I've got nieces that are coming along. I've got a great niece coming up. I've got nephews or niece in laws <laughs> They may not know Jesus. And if they go back and say, Brother Dave and Aunt Linda are gone. Uncle Dave and Aunt Linda are gone. And they see on the YouTube, and I'm going to say to them, trust Jesus, man. Run to Christ. Pay whatever it costs. You, got, you need to get saved. And that's what we need to do. We need to set... I know people who set little notes in their house, in their libraries. they got like little bookmarks in books. and you know, So if their loved ones come find their stuff, out, they're going through, they find this commentary. Oh, here's what's happening. Well, we're trying to put it out there for those who may be left behind using this as a field manual so they can figure out what to do. God has a plan for redemption. Isn't that good to know? Now, those who denied, 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 as it says, perish from the pew... Well, they might have a little bit of explaining to do, and they might have a little difficulty. But the Bible says that he says in verse 3, Don't hurt the earth or the sea nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. Now, what's significant here is, is that these are the only people who are sealed in the book of Revelation. Now, that may seem weird, but what seems to happen here is it seems to throw us back to the Old Testament dispensation of how the Holy Spirit worked. The sealing of the Holy Spirit is something we enjoy in the church age. But prior to the church age, we find even the stellar giant of the faith, David, saying, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. We see Saul, King Saul, who was uh, anointed by Samuel, goes out, prophesies, has the Spirit of God. The Bible even says he became a new man. But because of his rebelliousness, he began to find a, an evil spirit come upon him. And everything goes dark for him. And he really stumbles all the way into his grave from the time that the Lord left him till the time he gets into eternity. You say, well, what happened to Saul? Well, the Bible seems to indicate that he did get saved because when he conjured Samuel by using a medium, Samuel said, the, about this time tomorrow, you're going to be with me. Now, one could say Hades, and I get that. But what I have to believe in my heart is that God understood what a mess this man was. And then he promises David. Remember what he promised David? He said, David, you're going to have a son, and his name is Solomon, and we know he's Solomon. And he says, I will not take my mercy from Solomon as I did from Saul. So there's a debate among scholars whether Saul was saved, but look at this. He says, I won't take my mercy from him. And Solomon did a lot of bad stuff. Even though he was the wisest man in the world, he littered Jerusalem out of their cradle with all of the false relations, religions of the day. It is a powerful narrative to behold. But for you and me, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And the Holy Spirit is a comfort to us. And He's a, a, a vouchsafe, a promissory note of our own security. That once we've been saved, uh, nothing shall separate us uh, who are in Christ Jesus. And that's Romans uh, chapter 8 and verse 1 as well says, There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And later in chapter 8 it says, Nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ. We live in an awesome place and time. Uh, 
Now, what I want you to see about the seal these guys got in verse 4, it says, And I heard the number of them that were sealed was 144,000. Look at this. Of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, that is in no way unclear. That is in no way unclear. Of the 12 tribes of Israel, it's not Jehovah's Witnesses who have said, oh, that's just, you know, if we get 144,000. Well, they passed 144,000. They had to dial that back down somehow. But it is of the 12 tribes of Israel. Why? Because this is the time of Jacob's trouble. These guys come from the tribes of Israel. They are unique. And they are going to be sealed... And they're going to be sealed before these winds are unleashed through the blowing of the trumpets, if you will. It says, it says in the, of all the tribes of the children of Israel, in verse 5, it says, of the tribe of Judah, 12,000, of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000, and so forth. Now, the reason God is doing this, in one sense, as we know from reading the Scriptures, is that God never fails. He picked Abraham out of the midst of the nations. He says, Get thee up out of the midst of thy people in Ur, the city of Ur, in the land of the Chaldeans. He says, Get up out of there, that hotbed of idolatry. And he says, You come down here to a place I'll show you. And he takes him right down to the place where he is in Canaan. He says, All this I'm going to give you. He says, You're going to have more kids than you're going to be able to count. More than the stars and you can not murder in heaven. He says, Go and have so much. And his name was Abram, and it meant father of many. After he turned a hundred and his wife was ninety and they couldn't have any kids, he says, God, wait a minute. <laughs> Where are these kids you told me about? He says, Look and look at the sky. See all those stars. He says, The stars, you're going to have more kids than the stars in heaven, and no man can number the stars. He says, in fact, I'm not going to call you father of many anymore. You're not going to be Abram anymore. You're going to be Abraham. And that means father of multitudes. Why? Because he became the one who actually gave birth to a nation by the same means you and I get saved, by promise. Sarah was past the age of childbearing. Abraham was 100 years of age. They looked like there was no hope. When the God showed up and said, listen... About this time next year, Sarah's going to have a baby. She laughed. She laughed over behind the curtain. She wasn't laughing in front of God. She laughed. And the Lord said to Abraham as he was in his pre-incarnate Christophany that we have there in the tent as he fellowshiped personally with Abraham. He said, why did Sarah laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. She laughed. He says, oh, but you did laugh. And because you laughed, about the time you have this child, you're going to name him Isaac. The name Isaac means laughter. I think it's so beautiful how God puts it together. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob begets the 12 tribes, one of which was Judah. Judah brings us Jesus. Through what? Promise. God never fails. These people paid a great price to be our predecessors. We didn't get here just because we deserved it, because we didn't. But they bore the brunt of the day. They had to walk in clouds and thick darkness. Even the prophets did not understand the things they spoke of when they spoke of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that would follow. They didn't understand. They'd say, Lord, what is this? And it was told to them, you're not writing unto... Uh, this is not written for you. It's written for those that shall be after you. That's all they got. That's all they got. So they had to walk by faith in a darker place. You and I, glory ground, sealed with the Spirit, saved, secure, ready to go home. <laughs> okay, but they, they, when they misbehaved, Saul, the Holy Spirit was taken. David feared, the Holy Spirit taken from me. Renew a right spirit in me, David said. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me, David said. Why? Because things were different in the Old Testament. The only people we see in the book of uh, Revelation being sealed specifically are these 12,000 or 144,000. If you want to see the other place that a seal is mentioned, it's in chapter 9 and verse 3. There's a seal there, and it's mentioning the same kind of a, a narrative. Look at chapter 9 and verse 3 with me. The Bible says there came out of this great pit uh, these locusts that were like scorpion. By the way, these are the worst of the worst of the demons. These are the ones that had been... Um, put in chains for having left their proper estate from chapter 6 of Genesis. These guys were really bad. This is what the demons feared for Jesus when he came. They said, don't send us into the pit. You know, they didn't want to go. 
And because some had. These guys are loosed on earth during this time in chapter 8 or chapter 9. But look what it says in verse 4. It was commanded that these locusts that they hurt not the grass of the earth, neither any green thing nor any other tree or any tree, but only those men who have not the seal of God in their forehead. Now, here's my point about pointing that out. The only ones we see that have the seal of God in their forehead or the seal of God at all are these 144,000, which means if you get saved after the tribulation begins, you may not have the luxury of bypassing the pain and the suffering and the scorching. In fact, at the end of this chapter, we're going to see that all the tribulation saints come out scorched and thirsty and hurting and crying. My point is this. You don't want to put it off. These guys get sealed. Now, their sealing is going to be a securing of their, of their future. Chapter 14 and verse 1 talks about the Lamb standing with 144,000 all still there. These guys are Jewish evangelists in the world. God seals these people. Chapter 14 gives us a little bit more of their resume. They, they're, they're virgins. They're, they're not married. Uh, they have no guile in their mouth. And these are people who go out and they speak the gospel to the world in which they are in. This is what God wanted from Israel all through the Old Testament. He always wanted Israel to be a witness to the nations. They were the ones who had the sacrifice. They were the ones that had the Passover. They were the ones that had the manna. They were the ones that had the parting of the Red Sea. They were the ones that had Pharaoh broken, uh, had, were there when Pharaoh's neck was broken. They were the ones that were to take that knowledge when they were given the Ten Commandments and given a society of laws and given clarity and given a God who answers by fire. They were the ones who were supposed to be telling all the other nations, Jehovah is the Lord. They didn't really do it. All they ever wanted to do was be like, like all the other nations. We want a king like all the other nations. We don't want to be a theocracy. Samuel was so heartbroken by that, he just didn't know what to do. And God said, listen, Samuel, don't worry about it. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And he said, you tell them they can have a king, and when they have a king, he's going to do this, this, and this. It's not going to be happy. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be fun. But you want to be like them, you can be like them. This is like America today. Give me a bigger government. Give me the government in charge. We'll give them all our money. And certainly they'll be so noble and full of character that they'll give everybody their piece of the pie. Socialism, communism doesn't work. It's been proven time and time again. And yet we have a whole new generation who does not remember the former thing. And they're ramped up for it. When we pass off the scene, we have the glory heads. They will take our place and go for that, which is kicking open the treasury, but they will find that when the treasury is kicked open, it will be empty. Because those that live large will have taken what was in the cause. And then when Antichrist will come, the whole world will be ramped up for a socialistic one world system. It all makes total sense as you see it, but most notable about these guys is they are, in fact, Jewish evangelists. Now, one thing to note in uh, comparison to this, this is 144,000. As far as we know, the biggest outpouring uh, of missionary efforts in history was right after World War II. Right around 70,000 missionaries went into the field. 70,000. That's half of this. But 70,000 missionaries hit the field after World War II, and what is believed to have happened was these boys went into the foreign fields, and they fought for freedom and for the right, and against a, a man named Hitler. And what ended up happening was they saw the darkness that was overseas, and it stirred their hearts because they still had their moorings in the Bible and in prayer. You know, prayer wasn't kicked out of school back in, the, in World War II. You know, they still had a conscience. So when they had to pull the trigger, they did it decidedly. They knew there was a time to kill, not a time to kill. And they knew that, but they also saw the darkness and they realized, you know what, maybe if we just got them the gospel, they gave their hearts to Jesus and they flooded the four peoples. Thank God. But only 70,000 in its high, highest heyday of missionary effort ever hit the fields. Now we got 144,000 decidedly Jewish evangelists thrown into the world. They're going to go hither and yon throughout the whole world preaching the coming of the kingdom of God. Remember Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. <laughs> but he was the bridegroom and John was the friend of the bridegroom, like the best man. 
Israel didn't get on board. But now they're on board. 144,000 are going to say, you need to get saved. They're going to preach Jesus. They're going to preach His coming in the not too distant future. Because their message will be clearly laid out for them. After the rapture, they're going to get a clue. They're going to get born again, get saved. They're going to be sealed. That sealing that they get is one that answers back to Ezekiel chapter 9. When God was going to pour out His wrath upon Jerusalem, the Bible says that a number of angels showed up in the temple uh, courtyard with swords drawn. And they were told to stay their hands until an inkhorn angel went out and sealed in everybody's forehead those that sighed and cried over the nastiness of the day in which Israel was living. And that inkhorn angel went and sealed those that sighed and cried, came back, and then there was a great slaughter in Jerusalem. But those that were sealed were not killed. They were protected. So these are the only ones we know who will be protected in the time of the Great Tribulation. These are the only ones who are sealed with a protection that nothing can hurt them. We are told that the two witnesses who will be preaching will be introduced to later. These two witnesses will come. They will not be able to be touched or harmed until God's timing, which will be three and a half years in. And then they will be killed by the beast and he will go in and sit down on the Holy of Holies and say, I am God, and make everybody worship him. You say, that's crazy. We live in the 21st century. People don't say they're God anymore. Oprah says she's God. <laughs> right? She's a God. You're a God. We're all gods. Mormons, they say they're gods. Or they want to be one. Not a far stretch. But what about Pharaoh? He said he was a God. Caesar said he was a God. This is not uncommon. Do you remember the songs for Barack Obama? Charlie loves that song. In fact, I think it's one of his ringers on his phone. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Barack Hussein Obama. He was the one that pointed out that particular chant. And they were singing it among school kids. This is not unlike what Hitler did. Took down crosses in churches across Germany and put up the Fuhrer's picture. Oh, man can be full of himself in a hurry. In fact, I'm afraid we Americans are tending it that way. Not toward God would in the sense of wanting to take the world on. But, you know, we, 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 do, we do think much of ourselves, perhaps more than we should, not knowing that we are wretched. And needing some help down here on working basis. The Bible said that these guys are going to be sealed, and that sealing is going to be protection. It's borne up by chapter 14, and in chapter 9 of Ezekiel, the sealing was there by the inborn angel, sealed in their foreheads, secured, and they were protected. And what we see is that this is for protection, safety, and it also is a sign of their commission. The angel says that will hurt the, the men who were sealed in their foreheads in verse 3, and then these tribes are mentioned. Now, I will only briefly touch on this, but if you were to catalog the tribes, the twelve, you will find Dan is not mentioned, and you will also find that Ephraim is not mentioned. These are two of the twelve. They are replaced by Levi and by Joseph, the tribe of Joseph, which Manasseh is part of Joseph, but God's plugging in two guys. Why? Because Dan and Ephraim were benched for this great time of victory that Israel would bring uh, repute upon themselves through. These guys are going to be part of the, the blanking out of all the nonsense we look at in the Old Testament. They were always complaining, always rebelling, always turning left and right. And that's all we think about when we think of Israel. But these guys are going to change the, the tide. But these two tribes get benched for a season. And, and Ephraim. Ephraim was the kingdom of the north, and they put up the golden calf, so they introduced false religion. So they were culpable in a big way of really corrupting 10 of the 12 tribes. So they were benched. What about Dan? Well, you may not know this about Dan, but if you follow Dan, you'll find that on this crescent of Israel, you have the Mediterranean Sea. Now I'm doing it from my vantage point. I'm going back there so you have to I'll try to change it around. They're like that. Okay, this is the crescent of Israel. Over here is the Mediterranean Sea. They were supposed to take right in the middle. That was their inheritance. You remember what they did? They said, we don't like this, so we're going to leave. And we're going to go up here, and we're going to slaughter a whole city, and we're going to set groups down here. You ever heard it said, from Dan to Beersheba? That's God constantly reminding us, they were the highest northern born. They weren't supposed to be. They were supposed to be here. When Joshua took over the land, he says, that's your portion, go take it. They said, we can't, we're leaving. They rebelled. And it cost them. Interesting. These two were not there in this category. 
are not in this category. That's all I'll say about the seal then. But what about this next group of people? The Bible says in verse 9, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of nations, of all nations, and kindreds, and peoples, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white raiments and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb, and all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God. So whatever the refrain is of these individuals, it could be said that these guys are specifically doing a couple of things. They are, one of the things that they are doing is they are leading worship. <laughs> because when they, when they cry out before God, all the angels fall down before the, the throne. They are like worship leaders in one very real sense. But who are they? This is something John is seeing. It's a parenthetical insert. The sixth seal, the seventh seal, but wait, don't think about the trumpet yet. Remember, God's got a plan. It's always the same plan. It's the plan he has now. It's the plan he had then. It's the plan he'll have in the future. He has a plan for redemption. Listen, listen, very closely. I can't emphasize it enough. We are not here to feather our own body. We are not here to, you know, make our own little nest. We are here to engage in the redemptive plan of God. Now, people who get saved walk away from a whole lot of nonsense if they're truly born again. A lot of people think, well, I pray to birth because I don't want to go to hell. But they never really engage their mind. We get saved not from hell. That's a fringe benefit. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. That wasn't prepared for us. We are saved from sin. We are made dead to sin. We are made free from sin. That is what salvation saves us from. But if we go on in sin after we pray to be saved, quote unquote, whatever that may mean in our minds, there's something askew. It doesn't mean you're not going to sin. It just means that there's something you're not seeing the evil that threatens to undo us. And the evil that threatens to undo us is our sin nature. We're our own worst enemy. That's why Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from the body of this dead? When I want to do good, I find evil that's present with me. You and I live in a world where we think that it's just a Santa Claus God. It's idolatry to think God is in the heavens and he says, get saved and go play. That's not what it is. He says, get saved and get serious, because now you understand. Do you know if you're if you're on one of those steam steam liners and they're heading for a glacier, everything's nice and easy until you get your eyes in your head and say, there's a glacier out there. Now everybody's on deck. Everybody's pulling the cords. Everybody's spinning this. Everybody's firing up the furnaces. The Titanic is going to hit. And your friends, your loved ones, and you are all in jeopardy. Until you trust Jesus. And then it's all hands on deck. We don't, it's a train wreck that we're all now. Once we can say we get our wounds bound up at the cross, we go help other people get their wounds bound up too. Now I'm just saying, because down in the heart is what God looks at. And what do we understand? What we understand says a lot about us. How we navigate what it means to be saved. Free from sin, dead to sin, Romans teach. Reckon yourselves dead in deeds. He says in verse 9, this great multitude came. One of the elders in verse 12 says, uh, in verse 13, one of the elders leans over and says unto me, What are these that are arrayed in my robes? And whence came they? John wisely is put on air and said, I got it, I got it. And he said, Sir, you know. He said unto him, These are they which came out of the great tribulation. And have washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve Him day and night in His temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Look at this. And they shall hunger no more. Neither shall they thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light upon them, or scorch them, nor any. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, 
shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now, first of all, I just want to say that demonstrates to us that these guys, <coughs> these guys are subject to the scorching, to the thirst, and to the deprivations of the tribulation. They're subject to it, even though they may be saved. I believe what we're seeing here is very, very much in, in conjunction with what we see in the Old Testament. That in fact, in their, uh, their uh, vulnerability or their victory is dependent upon their degree of obedience. That's my opinion. It's what we saw in the Old Testament. When Israel served God, they prevailed. When they were disobedient, they ran. And many people will be just like you and me, just like Israel. We want to play, you know, a little bit of marbles with diamonds. We want to, you know, kind of treat it like a basic thing. I'll pray. But I believe what we're seeing, if we read the whole scope of Scripture, is in the Old Testament what we're going to see in these people's lives. If they are playing loose and fast with salvation, they're going to be more scorched and more hurt. And if they uh, play close to the Lord, they may find, as Elijah did, that there might be one cruise of oil that provides for days and months. I don't know. But that is a sanctified imagination based upon Scripture. When people walk in fellowship with the Lord, they have a smoother path. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path smooth. Make your path straight, or direct your paths. However you want to translate that, they're all in the Word. Make your path smooth, I like that. Be obedient while you're in the tribulation if you find yourself there. But for us, I believe there's something there as a touchstone. Because these guys hungered and they thirsted and they were scorched. But what you want to see also is that these guys are they which came out. They had washed their robes and made them white, in verse 13, in the blood of the Lamb. It is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Understand something. It was not just that Jesus died. He couldn't have done a lethal injection and it would be sufficient. Because God ordained that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Do you know why they take blood work on you? Because your life mapped. Everything that's healthy or not healthy in you is in that blood. They can read it. Now, they didn't know that. But now we know the life is in the blood. And you can have blood transfusions. You lose your blood, you die. George Washington, in the best science of that day, said your bloodletting is the way to go. He's sick, let's bloodlet him. And they have bowls where people would cut their wrists and let themselves bleed out so they get the infection out. It was wrong. Reality is, is it's the blood of Jesus Christ because you and I were not just under the death penalty. We were under a penalty of violent death. Think about that. You and I deserve to be ripped in shreds like he was. Now, I don't know. I... I don't believe that. Boy, if I didn't do anything so bad. No, you don't realize. Every bump, every decision, every movement, every word, every thought, every old front, every rebellion, one sin put them out of the Garden of Eden. One sin! Just one. Out of His presence. And we've already, just this morning, probably had a handful more than that. <laughs> And we would be guilty for how we slimed our loved one, how we slimed ourselves, whatever. It was, it was a violent thing. And when you understand the seriousness of your sin and my sin, you will understand the seriousness of Christ's crucifixion. With the cat of nine tails ripping his body to shreds, the crown of thorns, the nails in the hands, the blood, the piercing of his side, the blood mingled with water. That happened because it had to. Because a death was required, a violent death was required, yours and mine. When you take an innocent lamb that has no skin in the game, as it were, and you lift its head and you cut its throat, you feel the light going out of it as you hold that, 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 that lamb. And you are identifying with the fact that this is just wrong. And what is wrong on the left, higher level is that you and I, created in the image of God, do not glorify them as we should. You know the birds and the spiders and all of the creatures of earth, they glorify God. The sky and the sun, the moon, the stars, all glorify God. They echo a chorus of 
praise to Him. When you hear those crickets chirping in the night or in the early morning, when you hear the birds splitting, when you see them flying south and flying back north, when you see them making their nest with an uh, undauntable dis- determination, I mean, they can't want to get that nest up in your awning. You, they just keep coming back because God is glorified in His creation. But you and me, we have that. Imprimatur, that image that we bear. And many times they find like the groveling down in the dirt. And it was the blood of the Lamb that they washed their robes in. We need to put our trust in Jesus who died about the death so we wouldn't have to. By the way, people who do not trust Jesus, chapter 14 is still in here. And it says, Whoever takes the mark of the beast will be tormented with fire for eternity. Have no rest day or night forever and ever. That's the life of death. And it's written not to say only those who are take the mark. It's written saying those who take the mark because this book is decidedly the field manual for those who are in the tribulation. They're going to be pouring over it. And it's like he's saying, personally, you need to know if you take that mark, you're going to go to hell forever. Burnably. But it's also true. For everyone who would disrespect, dismiss, reject the sacrifice that Jesus made in God. And the Bible says that these, these angels then echo back a refrain, and what we see in one sense is missions accomplished. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10 talks about the fact that God would ordain that the principalities and powers might be taught the manifold wisdom of God through the church. <laughs> so here we are in glory and we're just in His presence and we're basking in the joy the tribulations unfolding and when everything is going on in the heavens, the angels bow down and worship with the Lamb there and with the church there and with the four creatures there. God wants the church to be that which shows forth God's manifold wisdom. What is that wisdom? That wisdom is the fact that he can take a sinner and make him a saint. These are tribulation saints. Who are these? These are they which come out of great tribulation so God can save. It's, a, it's an altar call. And God says it's a great multitude in verse 9, which no man can know. And these guys had one refrain. What did they say? It says, salvation, verse 10, unto our God. Now, the word here in the next level, when they echo it back, the angels say in verse 12, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. May I suggest to you that in your margin you put the word, be long. Because really that makes sense of this refrain as well as that of those people who are crying out in verse 10. Salvation belongs to our God. Jesus said, I am the way. No man comes to the Father but by me. The Bible says in the book of Acts, there's no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. The Bible says, man, when God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, there's only one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. Salvation belongs unto our God. Isn't that good? We have found the precious pearl. We have found the way through. The doors open through the key of promise that whoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. These are good truths. You and I live sealed just completely in grace, glory, ground. These guys are going to have to pay with their blood. And the Bible says they're going to be scorched. They're going to be burnt. They're going to be hungry. They're going to be thirsty. But when they get home, they're going to be as close as they can get to the Lamb. Now understand, these guys are seen in an image in the Old Testament. You may remember when Joshua was taken down the promised land. He was coming in and crossed the river Jordan by the miracle of the parting of the Jordan. He comes in and he takes down Jericho. And he looks like he's going to be... You know, schooling all the nations that were set up shop in there. And a handful up in the north come down and they, they, they pretend to be from a far country and they, they get some old crusty bread and worn out clothes and they say, we've heard about the greatness of your God and we've traveled for many, many miles. Make a league with us. And they didn't pray about it. They just made a league 
win them, not to hurt them, and never become their enemies. Ultimately, it turns out they were some that they were supposed to destroy. I mean, if Joshua finds out that that's true, and when all the nations around them, those nations found out it was true, those nations came out against them. They were to wipe them out for being traitors, abandoning their posts. Joshua marches all through the night, he arrives and he delivers them, but he says, we can't wipe you out, but we will make you, listen, hewers of wood and bearers of water to the temple of our God. When they come back, when, when, when the time comes after the Babylonian captivity, these guys, known as Nethanim, these guys, not Nephilim, Nethanim, these guys are the people who were up close and personal to God, wanted to go back to the promised land when many of the Israelites didn't even want to leave Babylon. These guys were up close to the temple for the first time. And as they were there, can you imagine? You're a Gentile in the midst of these Jews, and you're like, well, why do you do that? And the Jewish priest would say, don't bother me now. Get that wood, get that wood. And eventually they would come down and say, you ask me a question. I'll tell you why we do it. When we were in Egypt, God took a lamb, and he, slid, and he had us all take a lamb and split its throat, and the lamb, and put the blood, and you know, all this. And they would tell the gospel. And those people said, wow. Wow. What? He split the Red Sea. He wiped out the Pharaoh's army. He killed the firstborn in Egypt. God is awesome. Sign me up. <laughs> These guys are like, the world's under great tribulation. It's a time of Jacob's trouble. And these guys say, you know what? We're going to leave the ranks that we once identified with. And we're going to, no matter what it costs, we're going to go to the God of Jehovah. The God of Jehovah. The God of Jesus. We are going to say what we need to say. Salvation belongs to our God. You know what? When you get the pickle, your back's against the wall. You're struggling against sin because it's got a foothold in your life. I want you to remember these words. Salvation belongs to our God. Say it with me. Salvation belongs to our God. Say it louder. Salvation belongs to our God. Say it louder. Salvation belongs to our God. Because that is your victory. And salvation from sin at the outset and the door, and salvation along the road of life is what you need to focus on when you have no view through, no way to understand or discern, no way to make hide or hair of which way is up. You're just sitting there in almost a fetal position, freaking out, maybe depressed, discouraged, or scared in your dreams when you get night terrors. Salvation belongs to our God. I want you to know that when the time comes and the tribulation is in its season, that God has a way through. But we need to not take it. Like H.A. Ironside said this Light rejected brings a biting night. Darkness may be natural. In this, all are born. It may be willful. In this, men deliberately choose darkness in place of light. It may be, and alas, often is, judicial. In this, men are given up to darkness because of their own perversity. So we read in Jeremiah, give glory to the Lord your God before he caused darkness, before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains, and while you look for light, he turns it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands. 